Hello, and welcome to part two of the Indie Author Podcast on ghostwriting. And for this segment, my guest is Michael Kiefer. Hey, Michael, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you, Maddie. To give our listeners a little bit of an introduction for you, Michael Kiefer is a freelance author who's published more than 35 books and ghosted a half dozen more. He's a veteran copywriter crafting advertising and brand collateral for dozens of brands and hundreds of product launches. Michael has served as an executive editor at a publishing house, written hundreds of video and audio scripts, developed curricula, and for one glorious day was hired to write fortune cookies. So we're going to be talking with Michael about being a ghostwriter, but I had to follow up on the fortune cookie gig. So what's the story behind the fortune cookie gig? You know, when you're a freelancer, pretty much you say yes uh, to pretty much anything that doesn't actually violate uh, the law or your personal beliefs. And uh, in this case, it was a really easy job because I couldn't rely on my ancient uh, heritage of the wise teachings passed to me being a German guy from the Midwest. But I went to the book of Proverbs, which is Eastern wisdom in the Bible. And uh, good news for me, at least as far as I can tell, there's currently no lawyer involved. It's all been around for a couple thousand years, so it's copyright free. (laughs) The hardest part was coming up with the uh, combinations of these are your lucky numbers. Were they expecting sort of serious fortunes? Well, I threw a few things in. Yeah, they were. You know, it's ponder this while you're paying your bill kind of thing. What people really want with a fortune cookie is uh, either a really nice pithy piece of advice, something they can turn into a meme, or something that they can read and show their friends, really, I'm going to be a ballerina who wrote these. It's very rarely a fortune, though. It's almost always advice cookies. Always advice cookies that have been completely misnamed. Yep. And my favorite one is ignore this cookie. (laughs) <laughs> I think I, I still have the little piece of paper that I got in one that said, ignore this cookie. What was that one I needed? I needed that one. That's good. I also can not pass up the opportunity to interject that depending on which Bible you are using, if it was the King James Bible, it actually is under a royal copyright. Oh, I had, yes. No, I, 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 had, I, I reframed everything. There's a royal copyright. <laughs> King James was very thorough, as is every other translation. But the Michael Kiefer version of that is available. And yeah. uh, I, I leaned heavily that way. Yes. I was very surprised to hear that. I had Kelly Way on talking about how to use content legally. And we got onto biblical uh-huh. quotes. And she had that little gem of wisdom. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Anytime a king has done anything, you want to make sure that the military is not associated with the back end of it. That's good not to break that law. I think that's good advice. Mm-hmm. You're that's obviously w- well equipped to be writing advice cookies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) So tell us a little bit, now that we understand the fortune cookie gig, how did you get into the ghostwriting gig? I backed into it by accident. I I was working as an editor, an acquisitions editor at a publishing house, and things had changed. There was a time, and as you can tell, I've been doing this for a while, (laughs) but there was a time that it didn't really matter if you had a big platform. The publishers assumed that you probably weren't going to be moving many books yourself, And so it wasn't an issue that somebody didn't have 10,000 followers here or 50,000 followers there. And we were looking mostly for people who are influential in the field. And I would go to conferences that were in areas that we were servicing, a niche that we were serving publishing books into. And I would be running up and down the hallways, seeing how many people were at each of those little breakout sessions. And then just haunt, just basically, it, it's not really stalking until they file the police report. Getting to the speakers who were well-known and working the circuit, checking to see what was on their merch table, finding out what they published or hadn't published. And the unicorns I were looking for were people who had something to say, were relatively well-known, but had not published. And I came across a guy as a ghostwriter, I feel ethically obligated not to reveal who I've written for, because yes. if they do, that's fine if they don't. But let's call this guy Larry, because that's not his name. And Larry was well known. There are a couple thousand people at all these conferences he's speaking to. And I approached him and said, have you ever thought about doing a book? Because you actually have some things to say. But I want to make sure there's a book in you. Would you be willing to at least talk to me about it? So we got together, oh, a couple of times by phone and once in person, and I got an outline together for him, and we worked together on it, and getting ready to turn it over to somebody, and when the day came to do that, my boss, 
came to me and said, the deal's kind of falling apart. I go, oh, please no, because he doesn't want to work with anybody but you. He wants you to be his ghostwriter. And I went, I can't think of a bigger conflict of interest than an acquisitions editor assigning himself a book. Yeah. But that guy, he made that as the rule. And uh, so I didn't get paid. I was being paid by the publisher at that time to, to come show up for work every day. I got reassigned to work creating this book. And I loved it. And part of it was he was such a sweet guy and such a funny guy. And Southerners have a way of speaking that I'm just delighted by. He would sometimes say things and I'd go, I know what all the words are. <laughs> but I have no idea what you mean by those words. Here's an example. I asked him early on about the process. How was it going, us working together? He said, oh, I'm happy as a dead pig in the sunshine. <laughs> okay, I, I lived in Alabama and I have no idea what that means. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> I, you know, he's, I, I hear dead and I figure everything after that's kind of, eh, who cares? And he goes, no, that means I'm happy. I went, How did anyone come up with that? But the book did well, and uh, he came back, and I did another book for him. And then after that, once you've written a few books, and people know you've ghosted books, and they haven't heard any problems arising out of that, because there can be some that come up, then you have an opportunity to do some more. I, I guess the question would be, I would be asking if I were looking to find somebody to ghost for, what am I bringing to the table that they can't do for themselves? Mm -hmm. And... Oftentimes, people who are great public speakers are terrible writers. It's a t people who are good editors are terrible writers. And those are all separate sets of skills. Yeah. And if you're lucky, you get cross-pollinated and you have an opportunity to work in several of those kinds of arenas. That's going to be helpful. So the first thing I would do if I were going to go look is I would have already ghosted something for somebody. And that's one of those catch-22s. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a book. That's the thing that I would tell your listeners if you go to church, write the letter from the pastor. If there's one in the newsletter, if you still do a newsletter or have a website, go to some local businesses, do the same thing there. There's a way of ghostwriting called copywriting. <laughs> and I had the good fortune to spend oh, five or six years managing a copy team for a publisher. And I was a working copywriter, but I also met and we worked on figuring out brands and figuring out the voice and the tone. And copywriting can teach you to be a chameleon writer. If you do it for very long, you'll be writing a letter for this CEO or the introduction to that public report from somebody within the company. That's ghostwriting. It doesn't have to be a book. And now that really the smarter model for an awful lot of people is self-publishing, and you're never really going to have to go sell a uh, mainline publisher, then you just need to be able to take that person's voice, cover the material they want, and deliver what they're looking for. Sometimes people want nothing more than their memoirs. Hey, I just want my grandkids to know me, and yeah. I can't tweet. Sometimes it's, I'm one of 75 chiropractors within this zip code, and I need to show that I have some expertise. And so I want a book that I can go around and talk to the Kiwanis Club and just hand out. Those are very different goals. And so finding a person is part of it. Finding out what they need from you is the second part. And that takes some listening. Well, I'm very curious about understanding how you achieve that, those different voices. And I think it would be useful to understand what books you have out under your own name. Do you want to give a little bit of background on that? Yeah, I've been doing it a long time. You'll find most of them, as I have, in uh, discount bins <laughs> or... Uh, <laughs> slash chance eBay things. Um, one I have out now that I, I have worked mostly in the Christian marketplace, writing books for the Christian audience. But one that's out now that's doing pretty well is called Notes from Jesus. And it's, it's for early readers. <laughs> You're never supposed to read your reviews. And I, and I made the mistake of doing that. So I know everything is wrong about it and everything that's right about it. And I also know that it is number one in its category. And its category is something like Christian children's faith fiction, which is sort of like being the, the best pitcher in the American League who's left-handed, has six vowels in his name, 
and used to live in Bolivia. You know, if you get the right combination of things, you'll be first in your category too. Yeah, that's the recommendation to get that orange banner on Amazon is niche down go. as much as possible. Yeah. So I've, I've, I look at it two or three times a day because I know it'll be gone in a week. You just never know, <laughs> you know. So I'm guessing you're not ghostwriting for a uh, young reader, Christian fiction, that uh, category. No, that was, under, that was under my own name, yeah. Yeah. So give an example of a book that you've written. Are most of the books that you've ghostwritten within the same genre or across yes. gen different genres? Okay. Yeah. And I think this is a genre that your listeners would want to take a look at because a lot of people feel they have something to say there. Leadership. And that leadership principles are pretty much transferable everywhere. What's nice about that is most of the people who are asking for that book, as far as ghost it for me, they actually have some content. There are others, and I would advise you, your listeners, and myself to run away as quickly as possible if they approach you, of people going, this really cool thing happened, and I've got this great story, and all you have to do is write it up, and we'll split the money. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had that happen to you? I have had the people who come up and say, I, I have an idea for a murder mystery. I, I have <laughs> yeah, lots of ideas you, for murder which, mysteries. It's yeah, which is, on the page that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, which is what you write. And it's a little more complicated. To, you know, <laughs> not really leap over that whole writing it thing. Yeah. Leadership is one. And how-to books, believe it or not. There are people who, again, if a realtor approaches you, what they really want is... 95% of the content of this book, and I would make it 70 pages at most, because it's really a big calling card more than anything else, is going to be stuff that every realtor knows. But you're also going to have an introduction from that person in that person's voice. And it'd be nice to have a couple of specific stories about them or of successes they've had in their career uh, as a realtor sprinkled throughout. So again, that's a type of a ghost writing book where it's really kind of a copywriting and ghosting at the same time. So if somebody comes to you, they are the, the realtor who wants that book as a calling card. Mm -hmm. What does that engagement generally look like? Uh, it generally looks like a conversation about whether or not they really have a book or they have an article. And that's a huge difference. This is also something that happens with public speakers. They feel they have a world of content because they're out there talking to people six times a month, but they're saying it's a stump speech. Yeah. And so they have 45 minutes worth of material with a different introduction and a different joke. And that's an article. That is not a book. So uh, the engagement is picture two dogs getting together and sniffing each other. <laughs> Do I feel like we can work together? Does this person want to be involved? Or is it just a, hey, just write something up and it, I'll say I did it, you know? Um, so it's managing those expectations. How are we going to communicate? How are we going to know when it's done? What is it that you are expecting as the person coming to me, a realtor or a person with a life story or somebody who needs their life story pop down for the grandkids? Let's make sure we understand when we're talking about a book, what we mean by that book. How, pick, how long do you picture it being before you feel like it's worth doing? So it's the place where I switch back into being an acquisitions editor. All those logistical things that if you can get them talked about up front, you can find the snag and, and straighten it out as you go. Yeah. If not, you will find it. It just will be a terrible time. It does seem as if the effort and the way the engagement plays out would be quite different between the scenario where there's the real estate agent and there's probably research you can do to fill in some of that with yeah. some stories that re reflect their personality and their yes. personal brand, as opposed to a memoir, like that's got to be a huge difference in time investment, right? It's a, hu it's a huge difference in time and it behooves you to record it and get it transcribed. Mm -hmm. So that you've got the language and the feel of how they speak. For instance, you said you're from Alabama? I lived there when I was very small. I spent most of know? my life in Pennsylvania. Okay, because you certainly don't sound like you're from Alabama. No. <laughs> if you were, I, and there are regional differences in language used. There are um, times when people start talking about their youth that they have almost a completely different way of speaking. And if you hit a hard story... And I have sat with people 
who said, yeah, we want to do this book and we want it to be everything we've learned in our careers over this time. And okay, those are all business principles. Yeah, but no, we want it to be personal. I said, well, then let's talk about what's on the table and what's not. If you really want it to be personal, the more you say you want that to be true, the more self-revealing you need to be and the more transparent you need to be. Yeah. And if I step over a line, please know I'm stepping over it because I'm representing the reader and I'm curious. You're saying you learned that this is true. I want to know how you know it's true. And not, not just your thoughts, but where have you seen it? Where have you felt it? You're, you're going to engage people at a completely different level if you're willing to do that, at least occasionally. So it is a much bigger time investment. And that means I want more money to write it because I'm going to be living in your head for a while. And sometimes that's a scary spot for some of the people I've written for. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make that transition of making it sound like them? Like, how do you take on the voice of the person that you're writing for? Great question. That's where being a copywriter has been helpful because I got to fail so many times. I, I went to one job and I was hired as a copywriter. Day two, two, I'm told you are writing a letter from our CEO and we need it in, you know, 48 hours or whatever. And I went, I don't even know who your CEO, I know who it is. And it's that little picture here. I don't know anything about the person. Well, that's okay. You can make some stuff up. No, I, I really can't. Um, <laughs> Because if it's not true, eventually, is this person going to read it? Because you know, I've been here not long enough to be secure. And in this case, I, I was able to spend a little time with the CEO, discover he was a pilot. And so I, I said, well, what's your plane? I describe it a little bit. I describe how this feels. And I had my story and I built everything around that kind of a framework. So I think... To get the voice, the easiest thing to do is spend time with the person. It's also the most expensive way to do it because it's time. Now, in the fellow's case who was the speaker, he had, oh, probably 10 or 15 CDs of him speaking. So I, I listened to those. And here's the explanation that has always worked for me. This is my trade secret that I will give you if you're talking to a client you ghostwriters. I live in the Rocky Mountains. And so if I'm, and I'm at the bottom of them, but if you go up toward the top and you look, you can see peak after peak after peak. And the way I have described what I'm going to do for somebody as a ghostwriter is, you know, those things, author. And I refer to them as the author always. I am never the author because I'm being paid not to be the author. But every one of those peaks are the big things that you want to say those matter to you. And my job is to make sure they all get said. They all get said in a way that you don't lose people and that they make sense moving on through the book. But there's a lot of fill in between. And that's what I'm going to be contributing. I'll help you say the big stuff, but know that it's not all going to sound exactly like you because I, I will do my best and we're going to have to go back and forth a little bit but I'm going to introduce some material that connects those peaks. And we'll talk about it before I do it because I don't want to waste my time or annoy you. But that's what I'm bringing to the table. And for the most part, people go, oh, okay. They care about the peaks. And as long as I've got them, they're happy. Have you encountered a situation where despite excellent metaphors like you just shared, you get into the process and the author is still not mentally prepared for the journey, let's say. <laughs> Let me take you back to that meeting I had with the people who wanted to share everything they'd learned. I knew them pretty well. I'd been around them some, I'd read about them. And so they said they wanted to do a business book, essentially that was personally based. And I told them, a business book, you don't have to get personal. You just share a few stories from your career. It's the stories you've already decided to share with people. You get on a plane, they ask you what you do. These are the safe stories. I said, I know you have one child and you lost another one. How does that principle about this work in your personal life? How does that work in the business failure you had before the business success you have? And I said, those are the things that are going to really be effective. And they chose to not go there. It was their call. 
and I, I briefly thought security will be escorting me out at any moment. I did say permission to speak freely. I want to check this. I want to know what my parameters are. And the way you find those is you step outside them and you get slapped back in a little bit. Yeah. Um, they chose to not go as personally as they thought they would. And I was already into mentally having already got that thing set up. So that was a situation where I got a little ahead of myself and I had to just throw all that out and start over again. It turned out to be a pretty bland book, by the way, <laughs> but it accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. They're paying for it. I'm there to serve them. Do you read the reviews of the books you've ghosted? Never, never. It's not my story. And normally people who write one-star reviews are not terribly um, helpful as far as the depth of their analysis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is stupid. Well, I'm going to think that was the cover. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm like, if I'm not going to learn anything, I don't right. want to want to go there. I think if it's my stuff that I have an opportunity to revise, yeah, I, I, I would yeah. answer very differently. If it's somebody else's stuff, there's nothing I can do about it. So how often are you in a situation where the, the author is sharing the fact that they had a ghostwriter and sharing your name? Or even just admitting they had a ghostwriter. Boy, I, I've never been aware that that happened. Yeah. Let me tell you about a time that was uh, just really good fun. It's back to the guy who I originally ghost wrote for. But I'm at a conference. He's at the conference speaking. So I was back there to do something else. And so we got together. And, and at that time, I was still acquiring things. And I said, I want to walk through the displays. There was a booth after booth. And I just want you to tell me what you think when you see it, because you're a practitioner. And he was part of a large organization, had some influence. And I thought, this is a great way to, to kind of walk through this booth with different fresh set of perspectives. Well, everybody knew him. Nobody knew me. But they were coming out of their booth going, hey, we, would you like to take a look at this? They're giving him all these samples, which he's immediately handing to me like a Sherpa. Because... <laughs> We're piling up. I'm six, seven. I'm still like this, looking over <laughs> things, my arms down. And I'm thinking, talk about swag, man. And the people are saying, I loved your book. I loved your book. Thank you. Thank you. And I thought, you know, this is going to be, this is the moment that I will somehow come to appreciate someday. I'm still working on that, by the way. Well, I would think that that would be one of the biggest downsides of ghostwriting that I think that one of the exciting moments for any writer is being able to accept any kudos that are sent their way for their work. Is that in fact a downside for you? It's not for me because I spent so long as a copywriter. Um, when you're writing catalogs and you're writing outbound mail and you're writing websites, you have literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people reading your writing who don't know it's you. They'll never know it's you. There's no credit on it. It comes from the company mm -hmm. or it comes from the organization. So I think being a copywriter weeds out people who have, <laughs> well, who have healthy self-esteem <laughs> and uh, who don't go to prison. And well, that's a bunch of stuff, but it weeds out some people who feel like they need to have credit for their writing because you're not going to get credited and you just learn to live with it. The downside, I think, of ghostwriting is that you're taking time away from your own writing. You are telling somebody else's story for pay. Now, I have friends who refuse to ghostwrite. And the reason they do, uh, they fall into two camps. One is what I just said. Hey, look, I'm a writer because I have something to say. And I want to work on my voice and my tone. And I'm about to start a book next week. And I would expect it'll take me a couple of months. And I'm not going to work on any of the stuff over on my table over there during that time, because I want to be hustling through this. Yep. And the trade-off, you know, we also all know what it's like to write a book or to start down the path of a book. And we either can't find a publisher, a conventional publisher, who's going to give us some money. Or we self-publish and you hear crickets. Yeah. So it's a risk either way. The second reason that I've had friends who say they will not ghostwrite is they feel it's dishonest. It's not that you're a hack because you're writing somebody else's stuff. It's that you're lying about them being a writer. Huh. Uh, really? And uh, they would not feel that way if the cover said, 
written by so-and-so with Michael Kiefer, that would be okay. But, yeah. but going completely behind the curtain with a wizard means that you're hiding and that they are out there claiming something that's not true. Well, I don't know what they're going to claim. That's up to them. So right. those are two downsides. The big one being you're not writing for yourself. Is that scenario where it says so-and-so with so-and-so? And I'm thinking, I usually see that with really big name celebrities. And then they usually have the with is usually almost an equally big name journalist or something like that. Is that also considered ghostwriting, that kind of scenario? I don't consider it ghostwriting because you're not a ghost. Right. Or you're a very seeable ghost. That's calling in some help from some big guns. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are celebrities that write their own books, but there are very few of them. Another question I had is, how do you assemble a resume? as a ghostwriter that you can share with people. <laughs> That's a challenge. Now, <laughs> I'm at a, 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 the position where I can point to, look, I can prove to you I can write a book because here are 30 titles if you want to go find them. And here are the last five and you can definitely find those. So we're not talking about whether or not I can write a book. That's established. Whether or not I can ghostwrite a book is a whole different animal. And that you're going to have to take on faith. I, on a resume, say, if you want details as to who I have ghostwritten for, then I'm happy to share those. But we're not going to do it in print. And we're not going to do it until we're talking about a little further down in the conversation than just I'm blasting it out there. And I have at times called a couple of the people I've ghostwritten for and said, in this limited case, is it okay if I tell them that I've written for you? And if they want to see those books, they can. And uh, both times I've gotten, sure. Yeah, sure. For a one-off, no problem. Yep. So people are not unreasonable. It is tricky. I think it'd be really tricky if you wanted to start as a ghostwriter. You'd never really written anything for publication. Boy, they're rolling the dice on you. You're going to have to write one heck of a cover letter to go with that. Yeah. Is the fact that the books you've written yourself have been largely unlike the books that you've ghostwritten? Has that stood in your way at all in terms of pitching yourself as a ghostwriter? To oh, it's, it's, it certainly has. And people that work in any one genre often find it difficult to cross-pollinate. Surprisingly, mystery writers are not among those. I don't know if you're aware of that. People assume if you can write a mystery, you can write anything. It's like polluted <laughs> and it turns corners and it's got twins and, you know, <laughs> false panels and walls. And I don't know what she's drinking or smoking. They figure you can do anything. But Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. If you're writing in the religious market, um, uh, one, people are a little worried about you. And two, they, you know, like, is this person going to come in and try to convert me? Or yeah. Uh, do I have to be worried about this person? Yeah, the second thing is, there's a sense sometimes that the um, Christian Bookseller Association sort of books that sell in Christian bookstores are lesser books than other books. And I don't know if that's true or not true. I just know that that's out there as a belief. Okay, you can write a bestseller in the Christian marketplace, but out here in the real world where we throw some elbows. <laughs> okay, I've written yeah. for politicians and d and and a bunch of other places. So yeah, I know what the elbows feel like. I'm not worried about them. And were there any other pros or cons of having a ghostwriting career that we haven't hit yet that you wanted to share? I think the big one is just you're giving up on your own writing. Yeah. That's a huge cost because for many people, they just struggle to start and they want to get their 500 words a day in and they're working full time like I did when I was starting. And they're going to their job, they're raising their kids, and they're carving out those precious few hours to write. Yeah. You really want to use them for writing somebody else's story. And you can't use your own voice. Well, you can if they don't care, but you still can't use it because you can't point to it. You're not really developing the muscles that you want to strengthen. Right. Um, another, pro, But a pro is you're going to get paid even if it never gets published. You know, you write the contract for half up front half of the when you finish writing what happens after that i have been paid for books that are not in print i'm sad because yeah. i really liked them yeah but i also you know took care of the mortgage for a while yeah do you have any advice to offer people who are looking for a ghostwriter i mean of course you know that'd be my first choice <laughs> you know start with the tallest if not the best 
I think you, you can go to a number of places on wine. My advice would be, you're not gonna have any trouble finding people who wanna ghostwrite your book. Plug in ghostwriter, Google that, go to the sites, see who's there, see. Don't just hire somebody, talk to them first because you are going to be, if in fact your book is, a, is personal in nature, you're gonna be spending a lot of time with this person. And I think you should like them. That sounds horrible, except for the part where it's absolutely true. I have talked to people who wanted me to go straight for them. And after spending an hour with them on the phone went, you know, I just, my life, there's not enough left of it to spend six months with you. <laughs> It's just, and I'm pretty sure if I'm feeling that way, they're feeling the same way. Right. So go find somebody, but talk to them first. Ask around if you have any friends who've had a book ghost written. How would you know? Well, not everybody is as circumspect <laughs> as I am. <laughs> that's, that's, I see it as sort of a, a code of ethics, which means I could be lying to you completely. You know, that's you right. know I've done it. Yeah. Did I mention the Nobel Prize? Yeah, when I was in Sweden picking that up. Now you can fact check that. It's just see if you trust the person with your story. It's your story. Well, Michael, this has been so helpful and so interesting. And at this point, I would normally invite people to say where listeners can go to find out more about them online, but mm -hmm. you're you kind of a, a low profile kind of guy. I'm a low profile kind of guy. Yeah, that's what they said. You know, We'll relocate you, but we don't want people to find you easily. <laughs> Well, and the uh, conversation right before yours is going to be Rob talking about oh, okay. uh, matchmaking between the clients and a ghostwriter. So if people want to find you, then they'll be able to find you through Rob and through Archangel Link. They absolutely could. And Rob and I have talked about that. So I think they will be happy with that end of what happens as well. So yeah, they can find me through Rob. Well, thank you again, Michael. This has been so helpful. Thank you.